Committee will uh, will resume. Mr. Cicilline. Sir, in your Sir, in your opening statement, you continue with your sustained effort to undermine the finding of Russian interference in our election. In March 20, 2019, you sent a letter to the committee mischaracterizing Special Counsel Robert Mueller's finding that Vladimir Putin interfered in the 2016 presidential election in sweeping and systematic fashion to benefit Donald Trump. Mr. Mueller promptly sent you a letter calling you out for your mischaracterization, and you never corrected it. You then delayed the release of the full report, leaving the American people stewing with your misleading summary in support of President Trump's bogus claims that there was no collusion, no obstruction. You repeat these claims today, that there was no basis for this investigation, and it was politically motivated by calling it the Russiagate scandal. But of course, in December 2019, the Justice Department's own Inspector General, your department's, Michael Horowitz, found that the investigation had been initiated properly and without political bias. Isn't that correct? No. It's not correct? That was not Mr. Horowitz's finding? No. He, he, he said... You, you, are, you are wrong, Mr. Attorney General. No, that was... He found he the investigation had been no initiated evidence. properly... He said he found no Reclaiming evidence. my time without political bias. He said he and found no April, evidence. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Attorney General. In April of this year, the Republican-led Senate Intelligence Committee unanimously found that Russia interfered with our elections and attempted to undermine American democracy, correct? And I said so too. Is it ever appropriate, sir, for the president to solicit or accept foreign assistance in an election? It depends what kind of assistance. Is it ever appropriate for the president or presidential candidate to accept or solicit foreign assistance of any kind in his or her election? No, it's not appropriate. Okay, I'm sorry you had to struggle with that one, Mr. Attorney General. Now let's turn to the First Amendment. Uh, Americans all across this country have been exercising their First Amendment rights to peacefully protest police brutality against black people. I've read your statement, I listened to you this morning, and I'm, we're certainly aware of certain individuals who have engaged in violent acts. And we all agree that's wrong. But there was a lot missing from your statement. For example, as I'm sure you've also seen, the vast majority of the protesters are peaceful. And despite that, unidentified federal agents have attempted to prevent these mothers, veterans, and peaceful Americans from exercising their First Amendment rights, even using unmarked vehicles to grab protesters off the street and using tear gas and munitions against them. You forcefully condemned protesters this morning, but let me ask you, sir, why have you not condemned the federal officers you're sending into cities without proper training who are attempting to take away the constitutional rights of Americans peacefully protesting? I haven't condemned protesters. Protesters are good. Demonstrations are good. They're part of the First Amendment. So, I'm so let me ask what, what I'm condemning is people who commit crime. Yeah, we agree. Do you think it's ever appropriate, Mr. Barr, for officers to use force against peaceful protesters, yes or no? not against peaceful protesters. So you also don't mention in your statement today or your testimony that federal officers have even tear gassed elected representatives. County Commissioner Sharon Myron confirmed firsthand, last <laughs> night I was tear gassed by a federal occupying force. I saw throw canisters of poison without warning into a nonviolent crowd, including elders and the vulnerable. And on July 23rd, the mayor, Ted Wheeler, was tear gassed. He called the tactics of the officers abhorrent. These are elected representatives with grave concerns that officers are using abhorrent tactics, including tear gassing elderly nonviolent Americans. So let me ask you, sir, do you think it's ever appropriate to use tear gas on peaceful protesters, yes or no? Well, the problem in these things sometimes occur because uh, it's hard to separate people who Mr. Barr, my question is very specific. Do you think it is ever appropriate to use tear gas on peaceful protesters, it is yes or no? It is, it is appropriate to use tear gas when it's indicated uh, to disperse... Uh, on peaceful protesters? To disperse an unlawful assembly, and sometimes, Sir? unfortunately, peaceful protesters are affected by okay, it. Okay, now I'm going to show you there's video evidence as well. I'm going to ask you to look at this video. Just so you know... This is the video that's capturing the nation's attention this weekend, shot by Tribune Report. That video is of Christopher David, a Navy veteran, being beaten and tear-gassed by the officers. Do you think that was appropriate? 
Well, I didn't see him tear gas. I, there was, seems to be gas in the area. I don't know what kind of gas it was, and I don't know whether it was directed at him. Do you think what happened to General, Mr. David was appropriate, Mr. Barr? The Inspector General's reviewing that particular Well, incident. do you think he deserved to get pepper sprayed and beaten to the point of broken bones? As I say, the Inspector General is going to review the incident. So as the top law enforcement official in our country, do you think Americans who show up to peacefully protest should expect to be beaten and pepper sprayed and have their bones broken by federal officers? Well, I don't think that what was happening immediately around the courthouse was a peaceful protest. That's not my question, Mr. Barr. Well, that's where that... My question is, that, do you that, think as that, the chief... Reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time, from. Mr. Barr, my question is, do you think, as the top law enforcement official in this country, that Americans who show up to peacefully protest should expect to be beaten, pepper sprayed, and have their bones broken by federal officials? Yes or no? I don't think peaceful protesters should, should face that. <laughs> and that's correct. And isn't protecting the First Amendment freedom of Americans at least as important as protecting a building from vandalism? I think We've fought for, I'm, it's not, I've not posed a question. We've fought for a democracy, for the right to speak freely, and you are attempting to take that away. And what's worse, you're doing it for the sole purpose of furthering the president's political agenda and generating footage for Trump campaign commercials. The Justice Department is responsible for protecting the constitutional rights of Americans, not to serve as the president's personal bully or political director. And speaking of protesters, it's worth remembering every suffragette, every person who marched to, the, to end child labor, every abolitionist who demanded an end to slavery was a protester. The revolutionaries who transformed us from colonists into a nation were protesters. Protesters aren't chaos. They're deeply American examples of values, a desire for this country to be at its best self. They're righteous, sometimes they're necessary. One of America's most beloved and effective protesters, John Lewis, lies in state a thousand feet from here in a deserved place of honor. And sir, your failure to respect the role of peaceful protest in this country is a disgrace, it's un-American, and it's important to remember what these protests are about. Black Lives Matter, abuse at the hands of police by black Americans, and I want to let you see now a video that fairly represents peaceful protest that is happening all across America that you conveniently omitted from your testimony and your statement. There was a nine-minute video shown by the other side, so I expect Not all nine, courtesy. only part of it. With that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just just real, real quick, I don't think we've I don't think we've ever had a hearing where the witness wasn't allowed to respond to points made, questions asked, and attacks attacks made. Every not not just in this hearing, not just in this committee, but every committee I've been on. The so the particularly particularly when you think about the fact the we got the Attorney General of the United States here. The gentleman does not have the time. I don't want the time. I just want, I want the Attorney General to be able to have enough time to respond to accusations and questions asked him, and you guys not cut him off. What you want is irrelevant, what is irrelevant are the rules. Mr. Stubbe is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, am I going to get an additional two and a half minutes that Mr. Cicilline had? The gentleman is recognized. General Barr, thank you for your service to our country and your continued service to ensure that our country is safe. I encourage you to ignore the mob, these attacks from Democrats and the left-wing biased mainstream media. Be strong and courageous. 
for the mass majority of the country supports you and supports you rooting out corruption in the FBI and keeping our country safe from rioters, looters, and anarchists. I, for one, am very happy that you're at the helm of the DOJ and actually supporting the rule of law and fighting for justice. I want to touch on something that Mr. Jordan spoke about in his opening remarks. I want to focus on the Inspector General's December 9th FISA report on the FBI's unlawful surveillance of Trump campaign associate Carter Page. Isn't it true the Inspector General found the FBI under the Obama-Biden administration made 17 significant errors in FISA applications to surveil candidate Trump's campaign associate Carter Page? I think that's right. How many errors are acceptable when the FBI is targeting Americans? Well, none are acceptable. Then there was the complete Woods Files failures the FBI operated under during the Obama and Biden administration. The Inspector General found that 51 factual assertions in the FISA applications to surveil Page, one, lacked supporting documentation, two, the supporting document did not support the FBI's factual assertions, or three, the supporting document showed the FBI's factual assertion was inaccurate. The Inspector General testified there should not have even been one error, yet he found 51 errors. Why is it so important for surveillance targeting Americans to be error-free? Well, especially under, under FISA, which, um, you know, is a counterintelligence tool and doesn't have the same built-in protections that the criminal justice process would have. It's very important because you're going to be spying on Americans that you have an, uh, you know, you've demonstrated an appropriate basis for doing that. And uh, therefore, there's a special burden uh, on the investigative agency, in this case the FBI, to have accurate information as to the basis of their surveillance. And, uh, you know, I think the Bureau is, has been working very hard to correct those problems and to put in place a much more uh, effective system of guaranteeing that the information is accurate. Isn't it true the FBI under the Obama-Biden administration cherry-picked favorable evidence to obtain a FISA warrant to surveil Carter Page and ignored facts that cut against probable cause? Well, I don't want to characterize. I mean, this is uh, part of what's under review. Uh, some uh, exculpatory information was not passed along to the court. Let me just put it that way. That's evident in the Inspector General's report. I'll yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Jordan. Thank the gentleman for, for yielding. Um, Mr. Attorney General, do you, do you deploy federal law enforcement to enforce federal law? Yes. Do you deploy federal law enforcement to protect federal property? Yes. Would the federal building in Portland be standing today if you had not deployed federal law enforcement? I don't think so. There have been multiple attempts to set it afire. Yeah, for, and I for, and I you know have to say I don't understand why a small contingent of marshals inside the court poses a threat to anybody's First Amendment rights. They set up a fence on federal property. I am told uh, around the court, and when people are arrested, it's because they're trying to come into the uh, fence. These aren't peaceful protesters. They bring power tools to cut through the wire and so forth to get in. This is a very strange occupation of a city yeah. when you have you know, 100, 120 federal people behind the fence trying to protect the building, and all these people are trying to cut their way in. That is the occupation of a city. Thank you. Um, did the Chicago Fraternal Order, uh, Fraternal Order of Police, Chief, our president, um, ask for your help? Um, did who ask for my help? The head of the FOP in Chicago. Did they ask for your help? I, I think he did. I think he did. Um, previous exchange, they talked about Mr. Horowitz's report. Um, is there anything you'd like to add? You didn't get a chance to respond to that. Yeah, my, my understanding of, of uh, my recollection of the report is it, it didn't find there was no bias. Uh, it, and he made that clear that in subsequent testimony. Uh, what he said was he couldn't find no documentary or other evidence demonstrating bias. Yeah, and what would be helpful if maybe Mr. Horowitz could come in front of this committee and the individual who was raising that concern with you, Mr. Attorney General, could ask Mr. Horowitz himself about what he found in that report and subsequent reports that we have not yet had a hearing on. The gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Raskin. Thank you. Sir, 
did I hear you correctly to say that the purpose of unleashing this federal agent assault with tear gas and rubber bullets and pepper spray on 2,000 nonviolent protesters in Lafayette Square was to secure and defend the St. John's Episcopal Church? Was that the purpose of it? No, I didn't say that. I made very clear that the purpose was to move the perimeter to I Street, which had been the plan, as far as I'm aware, all day the week before. So it, it was legitimate in that I'm case. I'm talking about the June 1st. Yeah, the June 1st assault on a lot of it, people, it including my constituents, including my constituents. And well, I, it wasn't I had to a, bring them to your office to talk okay, about well, it. Okay, I don't think it was an assault. Yeah. They were told by loudspeaker that the park police were preparing to clear H Street and could they move well, off H Street? Uh, reclaiming my time, I think you said something to the effect of the St. John's Episcopal Church would have been overrun. No, that was on Sunday, on Sunday night, I believe. And I okay, hope I are you run. aware that the rector of the church, that the Episcopal Archbishop of Washington and the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church nationally, along with the Catholic bishop of the Archdiocese of Washington, all denounced this police assault on the civil rights and civil liberties of the people. Did they do that before or after the fire was put out? Well, all that, all that I know is that they denounced what you did. And if you read what the Archbishop, the Episcopal Archbishop of Washington wrote, uh, said that using police force to clear nonviolent protesters without notice in order to conduct this grotesque photo opportunity was antithetical, antithetical to the principles of Christianity. But what I want to ask you about was COVID-19, because we now lead the world in COVID-19 case count and death count. President Trump, of course, promised the disease would magically disappear. He advertised quack medical cures, like injecting people with disinfectant. He told his people to slow down all the testing and refuse for months to wear a mask. Last night, he retweeted a number of messages claiming that Dr. Fauci misled the American people by dismissing hydroxychloroquine as a cure for the disease. So now we have 150,000 dead Americans, 4 million infected. 40 million jobless. We lose more than a thousand people every day, one American every 90 seconds. But you called his public health leadership superb. And you threw the weight of the Justice Department behind his campaign to shut down state public health orders in March and April. Now, if you look at the screen, you will see two tweets from the President of the United States liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia. On April 17th, he retweeted the slogans of right-wing protesters that are blocking access to hospitals and trying to overthrow public health orders in those states. And you snapped attention on April 27th. You designated a prosecutor to try to bring down those very public health orders in Michigan and Virginia. Two days later, armed right-wing protesters and white supremacists disrupted the Michigan legislature, leveling death threats against Governor Whitmer, confronting police taunting lawmakers and forcing the legislature to shut down as they brandished their long guns and shouted in the faces of police officers. But you didn't send in a secret paramilitary police force on horseback to unleash tear gas, pepper spray, billy clubs, and rubber bu bullets against these protesters storming the state capitol in Michigan. No, you embraced their cause by joining litigation against the governors of Michigan and Virginia. Now, of course, your side lost your motions for emergency injunctions, but you got to spread Trump's message that it was time to call off the stay-at-home orders, the masking and social distancing. Here's what you said on national TV, echoing the claim in April that the cure was worse than the disease. Quote, you can't just keep on feeding the patient chemotherapy and say, well, we're killing the cancer because we were getting to the point where we're killing the patient. Do you remember saying that? Yeah. Yeah, well, what do you mean by that? Exactly what it says. You have to balance the cure with the, th with the danger, which we leave to governors. You know, I, I know everyone likes well, to no, lay, I, I know everyone likes to lay everything at the feet of the president, the but this is a federal republic, and the president respected that. And our, resp okay, we're and our response time. has been Ms. largely run by governors. Now, for someone who claims to be so concerned about executive overreach, 
I haven't heard anyone talk about just keeping an eye on what the governor's doing. Mr. Burr, with and no that, vaccine. And that's all the Department of Justice excuse me, the time is doing. Fine. Well, with no vaccine. In the area of religious liberty. Well with, with no, the, the Supreme Court rejected your position on religious liberty five before and said there was nothing wrong with applying public health orders to churches. That was on an injunction. Did you, did you accept that or you don't accept it? Uh, well, no, we'll talk about it later. Mr. Burr, with no vaccine, no treatment, no cure in sight, you work to disarm the states of the only weapon we have against this disease, Which public health measures. Which and now we pay the price of this policy in overrun intensive care units and morgues, a shortage of coffins and refrigerated trucks, and an out of control pandemic, which makes us a global pariah state whose citizens cannot enter dozens of foreign countries, including Canada. Do you know what Dr. Fauci was saying at the same time that you were moving to take down those public health orders? Here's what Dr. Fauci was warning us about three months ago about the premature abandonment of health orders. If only you had listened. He said, I feel if that occurs, there is a real risk you will trigger an outbreak and you may not be able to control it, which in fact paradoxically- We were not taking down public health orders. Time. We were making narrow- The gentleman's time is, the gentleman's time is We were calling attention Mr. to the Chair, fact- you, Will you restore my time because this witness is speaking over no, my you time? You went over no, time, cannot, let the witness over respond. He's trying to- The gentleman's answer. time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We do have a governor in Virginia who is engaged in overreach, particularly regarding the civil rights of Virginians and, and their expression of their religious faith. So I want to give the Attorney General the opportunity to respond uh, to the right. gentleman from Maryland. We, we, we ad adopted a very narrow approach of calling to the attention, usually by letter, not by lawsuit, of uh, situations where they were treating religion worse than they were other kinds of organizations and gatherings, and the Constitution requires that it be treated the same. And we were calling those uh, to the attention of the governors, and most of the governors that we called attention to voluntarily changed their own orders. There were a few occasions where we pointed out anomalies in the regulation, differential regulation of business, and again, mostly they were voluntarily uh, changed by the governors. So this was not a wholesale attack on stay-at-home orders. It was just that these are very broad powers that have been seated, you know, basically telling everyone to stay at home and only work if you're an essential business and so forth. And therefore, someone has to keep an eye on that and make sure there's no overreach. And as time went by, there were, there were times where, uh, you know, that you had these crazy rules in effect uh, that were overly burdensome and raised constitutional problems. I want to thank you for raising those points early and particularly with regard to Virginia and the church out on the Eastern Shore. Um, I want to thank you also for being here and for returning to lead the Department of Justice and right the ship and root out the rank partisanship and bias that had corrupted the administration of justice uh, for many years. Uh, the Democrats allege that Attorney General Barr has politicized the, the Justice Department doing the personal bidding of President Trump, but it's not only unfounded, it's especially hypocritical in light of the politicization that occurred during the Obama-Biden administration. and. Uh, led by President Obama's self-described wingman, uh, Attorney General Eric Holder. The Obama-Biden Justice Department investigated journalists, shut out career prosecutors, and flouted congressional oversight. I want to ask, uh, particularly, uh, even after President Trump assumed office, FBI lawyers exhibited bias against Trump while working for both Mueller and uh, the FBI's Russia investigation, and the Inspector General couldn't rule out political animus against candidate Trump as influencing FBI abuse, correct? That's my understanding. Um, the inspector general found that an FBI lawyer altered evidence to support a FISA application to surveil Carter Page and uh, criminally referred this lawyer to Durham for federal prosecution. Uh, the same lawyer who also worked on the investigations into Clinton's misuse, classified information and in Russia collusion expressed bias against uh, President Trump. And the inspector general testified back in December that he can't rule out bias. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, I'd ask, what would the consequences be to one of your Justice Department lawyers if they doctored underlying documents so they could support evidence submitted to a federal court? Um, you know, in the, in the abstract, talking generally, the, that lawyer would be fired. Would they likely be disbarred as well? Yes. And <laughs> isn't it true that the IG found that an FBI lawyer doctored an email to support probable cause against candidate Trump's campaign aide? I think that's right. And the same FBI lawyer uh, worked on 
the Russia investigation targeting candidate Trump's campaign and was on the special counsel Mueller team investigating President <coughs> Trump, correct? No, I'm not sure about that. And, and while working on those investigations, the Inspector General found several texts showing that animus, correct? Uh, on, on that particular lawyer? I believe so. Yes. I can't remember the time frame of the text, but I, I know there were other texts. I'm going to talk to you about the uh, unmasking that occurred uh, where Mr. Grinnell released a list of 39 officials who submitted a request to unmask the identity of General Flynn from November 8th, 2016 to January 13, 31st, 2017. 49 requests for, were submitted. Is that a normal number of requests for unmasking? I mean, it, historically, that's a, that seems to be a high number. And, and the other question you have to ask is why, why was this after the, uh, the election? And seven Treasury officials, uh, including Secretary of the Treasury Jacob Liu, Deputy Secretary Sarah Raskin, is that a normal occurrence? Uh, you know, there are times where high-level officials can do it. I, I, you know, don't know enough about the specifics to get yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Jordan. What, what, uh, Mr. Attorney General, what's more important, going to church or going to a protest? It depends on the individual. Both covered under the First Amendment, right? Right. Yeah, what's more important, going to work or going to a protest? Uh, again, it depends on the individual. <laughs> you know, we're all free. We can all make our choices. I'm talking about government limits on those activities. What's, what, what's more important, government putting limits on uh, protesting or government's putting limits on attending church? Are they both First Amendment? Exactly. Right. Exactly. And we should treat them the same, shouldn't we? Right. Gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. Jayapal. Mr. Barr, on June 1st, there were protests against the murder of George Floyd and police brutality in Lafayette Park. Let us not be distracted by you or my GOP colleagues as to what these powerful and massive protests were actually about. They were about the persistent killing of black bodies by law enforcement. And finally, finally, an awakening in America of the conscience of our country. And yet your response, Mr. Barr, was to direct federal officers to close in on the protesters and to use shields offensively as weapons, tear gas, pepper balls, irritants, explosive devices, batons, and horses to clear the area just so the president could get a photo op. So I do want to ask you, do you think that your response, do you think the response at Lafayette Square to tear gas, pepper spray, and beat and protesters and injure American citizens who were just simply uh, exercising their First Amendment rights was appropriate? Well, first, it's my understanding that no tear gas was used on Monday, June 1st. And Mr. Barr, that is a semantic distinction that has been proven false by many fact checkers. How is it semantic? Do you think How is it semantic? Tear gas is a particular compound. You talked about chemical irritants, and it has been proven false by reports. So just answer the question. Do you well, think that I think it was peppers, appropriate well, at Lafayette Park to pepper spray, tear gas, and beat protesters and injure American citizens? Well, I don't accept your characterization of what happened, but as I explained, the effort there was... Uh, Mr. Barr, I just the asked for a yes or no, so let me just tell you, I'm starting to lose my temper. According to sworn testimony before the House Natural Resources Committee by Army National Guard Officer Adam DeMarco, who was there, this was, quote, an unprovoked escalation and excessive use of force against peaceful protesters. Well, I don't Numerous remember, media I don't remember reports DeMarco confirming. as being, a, I Mr. Don't Barr, DeMarco excuse as being involved this is in my any of the time. decision making. Sir, sir. The president told governors on a telephone call that the way to deal with the protesters of police brutality and systemic racism like in Lafayette Square is that, quote, you have to get much tougher. You have to dominate. If you don't dominate, you're wasting your time. These are terrorists. And he also talked about you on that call, sir. Here's what he said. He said, the attorney general is here, Bill Barr, and we will act 
activate Bill Barr and activate him strongly. Do you remember that call, Mr. Barr? Yes, I do. But he wasn't talking about protesters. He was talking Mr. about Barr, rioters. Mr. Barr, apparently the president believes that you can be activated to implement the president's agenda and dominate American people exercising First Amendment rights if they're protesting against him. But let's look at how you respond when the protesters are supporters of the president. On two separate occasions, after President Trump tweeted, liberate Michigan to subvert stay home orders to protect the public health of people in Michigan, protesters swarmed the Michigan Capitol carrying guns, some with swastikas, Confederate flags, and one even with a dark-haired doll with a noose around its neck. Are you aware that these protesters called for the governor to be lynched, shot, and beheaded? No. You're not aware of that? I was not aware of that. Major protests in Michigan, you're the attorney general, and you didn't know that the protesters called for the governor to be lynched, shot, and beheaded. So well, obviously you couldn't be concerned about that. Well, there are a lot you, of protests around the United States, and uh, on June attorney 1st, general I was Barr, worried about the District of Columbia, which is federal. protests in certain parts of the country. You're very aware of those, but when protesters with guns and swastikas I'm very, and I am aware of, flags, of excuse me, Mr. Barr, this is my time, and I control it. <clears throat> You are aware of certain kinds of protesters, but in Michigan, when protesters carry guns and Confederate flags and swastikas and call for the governor of Michigan to be beheaded and shot and lynched, somehow you're not aware of that. Somehow you didn't know about it, so you didn't send federal agents in to do to the president's supporters what you did to the president's protesters. In fact, you didn't you didn't put pepper balls on those protesters. So the point I'm trying to make here, Mr. Barr, that I think is very important for the country to understand is that there is a real discrepancy in how you react as the attorney general, the top cop in this country, when white men with swastikas storm a government building with guns, there is no need for the president to, quote, activate you because they're getting the president's personal agenda done. But when black people and people of color protest police brutality, systemic racism, and the president's very own lack of response to those critical issues, then you forcibly remove them with armed federal officers, pepper bombs, because they are considered terrorists by the president. You take an aggressive approach to Black Lives Matter protests, but not to right-wing extremists threatening to lynch a governor if it's for the Trump's, if it's for the president's benefit. Did I get it right, Mr. Barr? I have responsibility for the federal government, and the White House is the seat of the Mr. executive Mr. Barr, let branch, me just make it clear: you are the, supposed the to Michigan represent authorities the people can handle, of the United Michigan States of America, handle, not violate people's First Amendment rights. You are supposed to uphold democracy and secure equal justice under the law, not violently dismantle certain protesters based on the president's personal agenda. Gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent to also introduce into the record a report from the MIT Election Data and Science Lab, which says that over the past 20 years, more than 250 million ballots have been cast by mail, and the fraud rate is 0.00006 percent. Without objection, Mr. Eschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, A.G. Barr, for being here today. I truly appreciate it, and I'm sincere when I say it's an honor. Yeah. A.G. Barr, let me just... Could I up. just ask you for one minute, though? To respond, yes. Yeah. Uh, as, I, as I made clear, uh, moving uh, H Street out to I Street as the perimeter was a decision made uh, the, the day before, it was justified by the extreme rioting that was going on around the White House. I don't remember Captain DeMarco, who was the same Captain DeMarco who ran as a Democratic candidate for Congress in Maryland, even being close to the discussions as to what was going on. Now, the fact is that the movement was not geared to the behavior of that particular crowd. It was geared to the fact that we were moving the perimeter out so we could put a fence up on H Street, by H Street. 
Uh, so, but it, it, it is a fact that the park police reported, and I saw myself projectiles being f thrown uh, from that crowd, so I did not consider them peace all peaceful protesters. But I'm sorry, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Hi, you're welcome, A.G. Barr. A.G. Barr, I'd like to also talk about the violent protests that are, that are being seen in Seattle, specifically Chaz, and also Portland, Oregon. As you know, over the course of June and early July, several shootings occurred inside Seattle's police-free zone, including, including the tragic murders of a 16-year-old and a 19-year-old. There were numerous reports of robberies, assaults, and property uh, destruction as well. Sexual assaults as well. Yes, and despite all this, all this chaos, all this violence, it took the Seattle mayor literally weeks to declare this an, un, un, an unlawful gathering and took weeks before the police were allowed to clear that area. In similar circumstances, let's talk about Portland, Oregon. It's been going through eight weeks of violent rioting in the streets as well. Rioters continue, in fact, to fire projectiles and mortar-style fireworks at federal, federal law enforcement officers and are using dangerous lasers, which have already permanently blinded at least three federal officers. Yet our own chairman, Chairman Jerry Nadler, told a reporter on Sunday that the anarchy and violence going on in Portland, and I quote the chairman, is a myth that is spread only in Washington, D.C., end quote. Attorney General Barr, is it in fact a myth that there's anarchy and anarchist groups engaging in violence in Portland? I think, there, I think there are anarchist and far left groups that are uh, involved in the violence uh, in Portland. I actually think that the chairman's comment was about Antifa. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't know exactly what he said, but I thought he, he, he was referring to Antifa. Well, do you think it's a myth that Antifa is involved in this anarchy? No, I think Antifa is involved in Portland. So either way, the chairman's comments were, were not correct, were not accurate. I didn't consider them accurate. Okay. What about the autonomous zone in Seattle? Uh, Congresswoman Jayapal has said, and I quote, that it's a peaceful protest zone. Is it a peaceful protest zone? No, uh, as I already said, it's outrageous that, you know, people set themselves up and uh, over a piece of territory uh, where the people in there have not selected them as the government and try to exercise sovereign authority. That's an outrage. And, and you know, we saw people handing out guns to uh, people to, uh, quote, keep the peace and so forth. It was anarchy there. Your office has already charged several violent protesters with federal crimes. Can you just briefly elaborate on those crimes? Well, they're, they're the, the whole gamut, I think, I think we've had 200 and 24, they were on the gamut from throwing Molotov cocktails uh, to, uh, you know, assaulting a police officer, that kind of thing. Thank you, A.G. Barr. I just want to say that I, I think, and I don't know if you agree, that Chaz and Portland are, are really like political experiments. They really show us what would happen if we fully embrace the radical ideology of the social justice Democrats. And now, according to Democrats, it's the summer of love. According to the Congresswoman that represents Seattle, it's a peaceful protest zone. Attorney General Barr, in reality, these cities are experiencing violence, chaos, and, and frankly, just anarchy. So I think this political experiment has showed us that the liberal, social justice, Democrat-style government has failed. Would you like to comment on that, Attorney General Barr? Well, when I was first being going through confirmation, I expressed concern about violence getting into our political system. And we'd seen some this intolerance and attacking people, and I was very worried about that. And how we've seen it sweeping through the country like this. And I hope the Democratic Party takes a stand against the violence. Thank you, and I yield my time. The gentleman yields back, uh, Ms. Demings. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barr, during your, over here. I'm sorry. <laughs> over here in the corner. <laughs> Earlier during your testimony, you talked about gun violence and you asked the question, what about those lives? And yes, Mr. Barr, uh, those lives do matter. But do you believe that police officers should be held or are held to a higher standard? Yes, and, and you know, someone mentioned my comment about we shouldn't 
permit resistance. We shouldn't take that as a matter of course, but I'd never suggest that just because someone resists that that justifies whatever is done. By thank no you, thank you so much no for that, that because does. good police officers also believe that they are held to a higher standard. So I'm yep. glad to hear you say that. As a former police detective, I've solved many cases based on patterns of behavior, and there is an alarming pattern, I believe, that's developing. It appears, Mr. Barr, every time a U.S. attorney investigates the president or those close to him, he or she is removed and replaced by one of your friends. You have removed U.S. attorneys in the Eastern District of New York, the District of Columbia, and the Eastern District of Texas. On June 19th, you announced Mr. Berman would be stepping down. Now, let me just be clear. When you told America that Mr. Berman was stepping down, did Mr. Berman tell you he was stepping down? No. Okay. But, but stepping June, down is the language that I am told. Uh, he didn't, okay, he did not tell you that. No, no. Okay, but, okay. but it's the language we usually use to leave to okay. leave uh, flexibility as to whether whether the person is doing it on, on the June twentieth. When asked about the basis for Mr. Berman's removal on the very day you announced he was being fired, stepping down, the president's personal attorney, Mr. Giuliani, suggested that, and I quote: "The reason may lie in the fact that Berman's office got involved in what Giuliani described as baseless investigations, sir. If that wasn't true." If you didn't remove Mr. Berman because he was overseeing investigations of the president and those close to him, why would the president's personal attorney think that? I'm sorry, what, what did he say and when? I didn't hear the quote. Mr. Giuliani suggests uh, that... When? When? June 20th. June 20th. That he may have been fired because he was investigating baseless investigations. Uh, well, if he said that, that's, that's nonsense. Number one... Uh, Anyone familiar with the Department of Justice would say that removing a component head is not going to have any effect on any pending investigation. Okay, and, and I know you're aware of reports that Berman's office was in fact investigating the president's former personal attorney, Mr. Cohen, his current personal attorney, Mr. Giuliani, his current personal attorney's associates, and his presidential inauguration. Well, Mr. Barr... I don't mean to suggest just by my silence that, that, that uh, I'm confirming that. That seems to be your opinion. Okay, all right. Have you in any way attempted to influence or interfere with any investigation in the Southern District, including the investigations I just mentioned? I have not interfered in any investigation. I've raised questions on occasion about certain matters, but uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the the, uh, I, the the office was satisfied Ms. with the resolution. Mr. With the resolution, your efforts to remove him bypassed the normal operation of law. Now we know the OLC no, they opinion didn't. indicates no, they didn't. that a sitting president cannot be indicted or criminally prosecuted, because you made sure. Uh, President Trump understood that in your 19-page or however long application, job application. However, you are aware the special counsel confirmed that a sitting president can be investigated. You did read that in the special counsel's report. Is that correct? Yes. Given Mr. Trump's residence and former business location, the Southern District, Berman's office, would have decision-making authority over whether to investigate the president in himself. And you removed him. I've explained why I, why I removed him. Okay, sitting here today under per penalty of perjury, do you still maintain, as you stated in a February 13th interview, that the president has never asked you to do anything in a criminal case? Yes or no, please. Yeah, no. I mean, will I confirm it? Is that no. the question? Or do you stand by your testimony? Or your he has never asked me, directed me, pressured me to do anything in a criminal case. Okay, all right. Uh, you are aware, and I think you had this conversation earlier with one of my colleagues, that the president's former attorney, Mr. Coyne, was released early from prison due to concerns of COVID-19. Yes. Okay, and why did you support uh, the decision to send Mr. Coyne back to prison? I, I, didn't, I didn't even know the decision to send him back to did prison. Did you support it based after you... Well, I haven't looked into it enough, General but Woman's my time. understanding of Mr. why it happened Mr. was... B Mr. Barr, Mr. Barr, as a former... The gentlewoman's chief, time has expired. The president has made a mockery of the Department of Justice, and I believe as the nation's top cop, no one should care more about that. 
than you. The Bureau of Prisons. Mr. Mr. Armstrong is rec recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ten years ago this summer, in July, in my hometown, it was a beautiful day. People were golfing, kids were swimming, everybody was playing baseball. Just a perfect, gorgeous, sunny summer day in Dickinson, North Dakota. And in the span of eight minutes, a tornado came through and destroyed, caused unbelievable economic devastation. I don't think everybody, anybody woke up the next morning and said it was a mostly peaceful day. And I want us to talk specifically about what's going on in Portland with you, Mr. Attorney General, because for 61 nights, the federal courthouse is under siege. But not just the courthouse. Federal agents are under siege. You have men and women there protecting that courthouse. Now, I have no doubt if they were there, that courthouse would not be standing right now. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And I think one of our problems is, is how we talk about this and how it's covered versus what is actually going on every single night in, in Portland at that courthouse. Can you explain what your officers and your agents are going through over there? Yes. Uh, the, I'm talking about the U.S. Marshals who were in the courthouse. They have initially tried to contain themselves in the courthouse. There have been efforts to push through in, uh, in the main door. When people have succeeded in breaching the courthouse, they have thrown kerosene and f fireworks and started fires. So then the effort was to make sure that they cannot breach. There still have been breaches into the courthouse. But basically, they try to remain in there. And uh, starting after the 4th, they tried to arrest the people who were directing fireworks. They would climb up onto the side of the court, break windows, shoot fireworks in. And whenever the marshals came out to try to uh, put an end to that or you know, interdict it, they were shot at uh, with uh, slingshots. Uh, lasers were constantly being put uh, into their eyes even when they're inside the courthouse. There's a good description of it in an AP story. I was just going to quote that. We don't have to take your word. I watched as injured officers were hauled inside. In one case, the commercial firework was, came over so fast the officer didn't have time to respond. It burned through his sleeve, and he had bloody gashes on both forearms. Another had a concussion from being hit in the head with a mortar. Right. That's right. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of injuries out there. And... Uh, uh, these are people who this Congress has charged with protecting federal courts. They're directed to protect federal courts in the U.S. Code, and they are under attack. And, and they're act, being injured, act, and it's been constant for 60 days. Acting Secretary Wolf has said that the violent mobs are publishing personal information of federal officers, jeopardizing not only them, but their families. Why is doxing federal agents so dangerous, and are you concerned about it? Well, it's dangerous uh, because uh, people can take retaliation against their homes, their families, or or uh, them. You know, when they're when they're by themselves. You know, I see some of these Latin American countries in Central America where the police are very, very brave because uh, the gangs they're trying to deal with go to their houses and kill their families. And uh, you know, you never think that could happen here, but. You could never think some of the stuff we're seeing today could ever happen here. Is being burned by essentially improvised explosive device, being blinded by lasers, is this something that typically happens with federal marshals in federal courthouses? No, not at all. Um, how is this handled? How, how is this going for re re recruitment, morale? How are they doing? I mean, I generally want to know how are they doing? <laughs> well, I think that AP story. Uh, you know, gives you a feel. They, they feel that's their duty and they feel that's where they have to be. A number of them are from that area. Uh, but they're extremely tired and, you know, we've had to rotate in some more. We're put in some more people because they're very, very tired and you make mistakes when you're tired. Well, and I think that's an important part because I think one of the most amazing parts of this whole thing, it started with under 30 agents there and now it's still under 100. 61 nights in a row they defend against a, a siege, fires, burning down these things. You know what's the most amazing thing? They get up every morning and that courthouse is still running. Yep. They're still conducting the federal government's business. So I'm going to say something that I think should be, should be said a lot more often. Tell them thank you. Tell the courthouse personnel thank you, tell the clerks thank you, tell the prosecutors thank you, tell the judges thank you. And if, if, if you can handle it, can you tell the public defenders thank you too? Because they're still conducting the business. They do this every single night. Are they getting sleep? The marshals are not are having a difficult time because their demonstrators go to the hotel. They also 
go from hotel to hotel uh, because the demonstrators try to disrupt their sleep at the hotel. So, and it, there's a difference between a protest and a riot. Every night at some point in time in Portland, it turns into a riot. Eventually, when you wake up the next morning and you know what's going to happen again, then we need to figure out a way to stop it. Yeah. And then just one last question. Why would we have to negotiate a ceasefire with a peaceful protest? You're, Correct, but why would you know? That's that's right. You know, well, we don't want what we would like to see, and all we would like is what we see in the rest of the country, which is state and local law enforcement taking care of their own city and taking care of the streets around the courthouse. The gentleman's time has expired. Is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Barr, welcome. Let's talk a little bit about the census if we can. As you know, that's the process where every 10 years we decide how many <coughs> congressional seats each state gets, how much funding for schools, health care, other issues each region gets. Um, let's talk about the President's memo uh, directing the Commerce Secretary to exclude undocumented immigrants from the apportionment count uh, the, of the 2020 census count. Um, Mr. Barr, President is essentially saying something, trying to do that something that's unconstitutional and illegal. 14th Amendment, and I quote, representatives shall be apportioned among several states according to their respective numbers, counting whole numbers of person in each state. And then federal law, as you know, 2 U.S.C. subsection 2A, and I quote, the President shall transmit to the Congress a statement showing the whole number of persons in each state. Did I read those correctly, sir, more or less? Yes. Do you agree that the President's memo essentially violates the Constitution? No. Are undocumented people not whole individuals? Are not what? Are undocumented individuals in this country not whole people? Um, they, are, they are obviously people, but the legal issue there was uh, the terminology of the Constitution. Well, if I may. Uh, it reflects the, uh, reflects the, the decision uh, at the time of the Constitution that they count inhabitants. If I may the, the, my time, sir. Just, you well, used to work for the Just, Department of Justice back in 1989. There was a letter written to Senator Jeff Bingham by the DOJ on point. If there's a slide, there's a letter, uh, and I would ask unanimous consent to admit that to the record. Without and I, objection. And I quote, in the past, the Department of Justice has taken the position that Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, that the original apportionment and census clause of Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, requires that inhabitants of states who are illegal aliens be included in the census count. And in our view, this issue today, we have found no basis for reversing that position. Are you reversing that position now? Well, I think what the department advised is that, uh, what, this came up because Alabama claims you cannot count illegal aliens in the census under the Constitution. Uh, the department looked at it and advised that Congress can determine the meaning of inhabitant for this purpose, that, they're, that it is not a self-defining term as they only got two minutes, sir. That they recognized. Mr. Barr, if I Yeah, may. but this is a hearing. I thought I was the one that was supposed to be heard. Well, let me, and I'm going to get there. The current dispute, you, you talked uh, back when the uh, Supreme Court struck down the president's attempt to um, put a citizenship question on the census. Uh, at that time, the president announced an executive order to collect citizenship information by other means. And at that time, you made reference to a current dispute over whether illegal aliens can be included in the apportionment purposes. Is that what you're referring to now, sir? I think that I, I could have been referring to the Alabama case. So I can't remember. Is what the I DOJ was studying this issue? Have you concluded? Yes. Can you provide this committee with discussions, any research, any concluding memos on that issue? I'll, I'll look into it. But we have considered it, and I, as I said, our advice is 
has been that uh, Congress does have the power to define the term inhabitant to in either include or exclude illegal aliens. But we're talking aliens. about the president's executive orders. Here, well, sir. Congress has delegated that power to the Commerce Secretary. So as the law stands now, we think the Commerce Secretary, as the delegate of congressional power, can define that term. Mr. That Attorney is a General. That's a reasonable argument to make. Mr. Attorney General, in the last few seconds I have, president has to be within the law. Nobody is above the law in this country, including the President of the United States. My concern is he goes around doing tweets, memos, dictums that are clearly unconstitutional. My district, sir, is a working class, hard working community, immigrants, the greatest generation. All we want is equity based on the census. We want to make sure we get our federal dollars like everybody else around the country. We want to make sure that our representation is equal, individual, individual, in Orange County as it is in other parts of the country. All we ask for is respect, sir. I ask you, please tell the president, stop tweeting things, stop writing memos that are clearly, clearly unconstitutional. Thank you very much, and I yield. The gentleman yields back, uh, Ms. Tiffany. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Attorney General Barr, will you send a thank you to the law enforcement people that work for you uh, for the work that they're doing here across the United States of America? Sure. And I want to thank all the law enforcement across our country. Um, we are an imperfect country, but law enforcement has done a uh, they do a good job across our country, and they should be recognized for that. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about Mr. Burnell Trammell from Milwaukee here in just a minute. He was the man who was shot to death at the end of last week. Uh, he's the African-American man who was wearing a sign, and he's regularly known around Milwaukee for um, carrying a uh, Trump for president sign. But I want to share with you what happened in Madison, Wisconsin, so we all understand that this is not a myth um, about Antifa. So when the riots hit Minneapolis and then extended around the country, they hit Madison, Wisconsin also. And I don't know if you've ever visited Madison, Wisconsin. There's yes. an iconic street there called State Street. Starts at the Capitol and runs all the way down to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And that street, if you go there now, 75 businesses are boarded up as a result of a mayor and city council who would not protect those people. Those people went to the city council last week and they asked for some assistance. The city council who would not protect their business, they said, no, we're not going to provide you for assistance. Shortly after State Street, uh, State Street was uh, destroyed, and by the way, it's disappointing in some of the uh, um, uh, film that I've seen that the police cruiser that went flaming down State Street was not included in that. But um, shortly after that, about a week afterwards, um, two monuments at the state capitol that I used to walk by all the time uh, were torn down. One was of Hans Christian Haig, who was the abolitionist um, Norwegian immigrant who died at Chickamauga defending the Union and providing for um, the end of slavery, fighting for the end of slavery here in the United States. The other monument that was torn down, by the way, they took a tow truck and tore it down, was Lady Forward. Lady Forward is there because of women's suffrage. Wisconsin was the first state to, to pass suffrage back in the early 1900s here in the United States of America. Those were torn down. Just yesterday, a woman, a social worker, who teaches at a local school um, just outside Madison in uh, Mount Horeb, uh, she was charged with beating a state senator, a Democrat state senator. Her name is Samantha Hamer. Hopefully she will be given justice. But I want to emphasize to my colleagues on the left that if you think you're insulated from Antifa, which is supposedly a myth, you should really think about that because them and other radicals, they will not spare violence on anyone. Their anarchy is meant to destroy our country. And I would ask you to, if you want to contact a former colleague of mine, State Senator Tim Carpenter, a Democrat, he'll tell you, 
he was beat to a pulp on that night at midnight when they were tearing down those statues. It is not a myth. So, Mr. Attorney General, I would ask Mr. Bernal Trammell, um, I don't know if our Attorney General, Attorney General Call in Wisconsin or the mayor of Milwaukee are going to pursue what appears to perhaps be a political execution. Are you familiar with that situation in Milwaukee? You mean the shooting of that gentleman? Yes. I, I've read about it. If the Attorney General and other law enforcement in Wisconsin do not act, will the federal government study this situation and bring justice for Mr. Trammell and his family? Yes, we'll certainly study that situation. This is not a myth. You're hearing it from all over the country, and we're hearing all the time about Portland and Seattle. This happened in Madison, Wisconsin also, where a mayor, a far leftist mayor, proudly carries that banner, sat on a street, actually not a street, a highway with protesters, and shut down traffic. And then State Street, one of the most iconic streets in the uh, state of Wisconsin and in Madison, was destroyed. And I'm not so sure that those businesses are going to get their businesses back. It is not a myth, folks. What's happening is real across our country, and we need to stop the riots. These are not peaceful protests. These are riots that are happening, and we need to uh, call an end to it. And I hope you, Mr. Attorney General, will work towards that end. Thank you. The gen gentleman yields back, Ms. Scanlon. Attorney General Barr, I wanted to follow up on some questions from one of my colleagues. You testified earlier that you have at times voted by mail, is that correct? I remember, I think, once voting by mail. So if public records show you voted by mail in 2012 and 2019, you'd agree yeah, I with think, that? I think, you know, I, I can't really remember the details. Okay. I think on one occasion I had to go to a station and okay. vote, vote but you before did the election. Vote I think in another I'm one I voted by mail. I'm claiming my time, sir. Yeah. Um, I raise this because in May of this year, 800 public health experts from across the nation sent a letter urging Congress to, quote, prepare for a presidential election by mail to allow Americans to vote from home and assure their health and safety. You're aware that health experts have emphasized that voting by mail is critical to protect public health in this upcoming election, correct? When was that? In May of this year. Right. If you're not aware of it, I can provide okay. this to I'd be you, interested in your seeing. staff. Yeah. Great, I have an extra copy for you. So that public health advice is really important to citizens in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania because we have a large population of seniors who are at higher risk for the coronavirus. Uh, they shouldn't have to choose between risking their lives and exercising their right to vote. But the problem we're facing is that the president has repeatedly sought to cast doubt on the security of mail-in ballots, saying that the 2020 election could be rigged with, quote, millions of mail-in ballots printed by foreign countries, end quote. And you, sir, have repeated this disinformation. Well, it's not just information. I, I don't have a question for you yet. Here it comes, though. Uh, last month, you echoed the president's conspiracy theory when you suggested in at least three interviews that, quote, foreign countries could manufacture counterfeit ballots, end quote, to influence the presidential election, correct? You did that in at least three interviews? Yes. Okay. But in fact, you have no evidence that foreign countries can successfully sway our elections with counterfeit ballots, do you? No, I don't, but I have common okay. sense. Okay. Well, and that's what you responded when you were directly challenged on that. You said, no, no you didn't have evidence, but it was obvious. Um, according to state election officials, your alleged concerns here are not obvious, but in fact are outrageous. Um, every state in the union has absentee ballots. Two-thirds of the states allow for vote by mail by, for any reason. Five states, Colorado, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, and Utah, vote entirely by mail and have done so for decades. Even the U.S. military uses mail-in ballots, doesn't it? Yes. Okay. So isn't it true that after you suggested without evidence that foreign adversaries could sway our elections using counterfeit ballots, election experts and officials from around the country said that what you suggested was 
virtually impossible, preposterous, would never happen, and would be readily detected due to the multiple levels of security used with mail-in ballot systems? There, there are not multiple levels of security. Okay, well, so and, and I don't recall, agree. I don't agree that it's a that it's a. Okay, uh, reclaiming my time, and again, I'm yeah. happy to supply you with the yeah. um, statements that were before provided Donald from Trump the raised concerns about in it. Every fact, major publication. Reclaiming my time, sir. In fact, there is no evidence that foreign countries can make counterfeit ballots and create a real threat to our election security. Are you aware that in May, the president tweeted, and I quote, mail-in voting will lead to massive fraud and abuse. It will also lead to the end of our great Republican Party, end quote. I wasn't aware of that tweet. Well, that tweet suggests, sir, that the president is spreading disinformation about mail-in ballots because he's afraid that if more people vote, he and his party will lose. The fact, Mr. Barr, is that our foreign adversaries cannot actually influence our elections by submitting massive uh, counterfeit ballots, but the FBI and our intelligence services have repeatedly warned that those adversaries are actively trying to sow mistrust of our election systems, and by repeating disinformation about mail-in voting, you and the president are helping them. Uh, just switching gears, you would agree. Well, I'd like the opportunity to respond You would agree that, that prosecutors who make political contributions are identifying fairly strongly with a political party, wouldn't you? Who, who, who makes con contributions? You said in 2017 that prosecutors who make political contributions are identifying fairly strongly with a political party, yes. correct? Yes, yes. And in fact, you and your wife have donated over $730,000 to Republican and conservative candidates, including donations of $58,000 to Republican senators and Senate candidates in the four months preceding your confirmation. Are That's you correct. Are you surprised I'm a Republican? Is that correct that you made those donations? Over, over a long period of time. Including just before. Okay. Uh, that's a cumulative of a long period of time, but basically Mr. I've Chairman, never heard the I fact I'm a back, Republican. And I, I was talking also, about career prosecutors generally, have generally historically avoided making contributions, was my view. $730,000 is not. Okay. Time of the gentlelady has expired, Ms. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would like, I would seek unanimous consent to introduce the 800, the, the public health expert letter signed by 800 individuals, uh, the attorney general's uh, repeated interviews in which he suggested that our elections could be undermined, the overwhelming reaction from election officials around the country, and the articles concerning his campaign donations. Thank Without you. objection, the articles will be uh, entered into the record. Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barr, your department released Paul Manafort, the president's former campaign manager, early from prison in May out of concern for the coronavirus. In March of 20, March 26 and April 3rd, your department released um, guidelines, criteria by which, pri setting priorities by which people would be released early. By your own department's admission, Manafort did not meet that criteria. Since the start of this pandemic, we have repeatedly urged you to use your authority to protect vulnerable populations in prisons, and instead you released the president's former campaign manager. Sir, do you know how many federal inmates have tested positive for COVID-19 as of today? Yeah, I have that number. Um, Quickly, sir, because the clock ticks. Well. Well, we have a slide, if you'll they'll bring it up, that, that shows us that 10,000 inmates have tested positive and over 1,000 staff have tested positive. Do you know how many have died? Uh, uh, well, about 100, almost 100, I think. That's right. It's about 99 inmates have died, and yet only 5% have been released under your guidelines. 7,000. You, you stated in May that you were taking, quote, every measure we can to protect federal inmates. The numbers, however, tell a different story, as do your actions. Despite releasing Manafort, your lawyers continue to argue against the release of prisoners. In April, vulnerable prisoners who suffer from serious at-risk health conditions like chronic asthma, health, health disease, heart disease, and kidney disease filed a lawsuit for early release in Ohio. These prisoners were being, quote, overcrowded in like cattle. 
because prisoners were not able to social distance them. 550 prisoners sought release, yet your own department processed only seven applications and denied them all. Yet you had time to process Manafort's application. I didn't but process Manafort's well, application. Well, your department did, sir. But apparently not these vulnerable Americans living at great, grave risk. In fact, in a series of rulings in April and May, an Ohio district court ordered that your department, quote, act with urgency and to, quote, move inmates out due to continued risk of harm to prisoners and to government staff. And sir, your department challenged that court order, did it not? I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Well, well, you all did. You did not help move these inmates out as ordered. In fact, you tried to block the, the district court's order. However, the Supreme Court on May 26 rejected your department's request. Sir, nine prisoners had died, and it's been two months since the Supreme Court's order. Do you even know today how many of those prisoners have been released or how many more have died? No, I don't. You know, we had a hundred, well, we started out this with 170,000 prisoners. Well, so sir, we've I, lost. I just need you to try to explain to me and to America, how is it that the, for, the former campaign manager of the president of the United States did not meet the, who did not meet the priority criteria got released, even though your own department admitted he didn't meet the guidelines, but all these other folks, were not. If it was deadly enough of a virus that you needed to protect the former campaign manager, why not all of these Americans who also have vulnerable, are vulnerable and have at-risk conditions? Mr. Barr, the contrast says it all. And it is not just in Ohio. In fact, in my own home state in Texas, a federal prison housing women with mental and medical health issues just confirmed last week that of the 1,357 prisoners, over 500 tested positive for COVID. One prisoner recounted, we're like a whole bunch of hamsters in a cage chasing our own tails, and yet none have been released. Mr. Barr, have you seen those statistics? Yes or no? The, well, if you can't I put out guidelines, general guidelines, which as, sir, uh, which to sir, propel you, the release you of. Not release anyone. I put out general One guidelines. One of those prisoners is a mother, Andrea Circle Bear, who had to give birth on a ventilator in that facility because your department prioritizes releasing Paul Manafort instead of vulnerable Americans. A few weeks after this photo, Ms. Bear died along with two other women housed in this facility from COVID-19. Sir, you could, could be saving lives by reducing the prison population. Yet you have blatantly abandoned your duty to these women. You have shamelessly abandoned your oath of office to protect all Americans impartially because you have prioritized giving special favors to the president's friends. This is not equal justice under the law. It's not the law that you and I both learned in law school. It is too simple simple systems of justice, one for the president's friends and one for everyone else. The and director of wrong, the BOP. It is flat wrong. Yeah, the director. And I yield back. Yeah, the director of the BOP testified, the, testified under oath that no one from yields, Justice Department was involved. General lady yields back. Yeah, but, Ms. The, but the gentleman has not been given an opportunity to respond. And Ms. that's Nagoose. been a consistent problem. Mr. Nagoose is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Attorney General. I want to go through a couple of your prior statements. Uh, on April 19th, or excuse me, April 18th of 2019, you stated, quote, that the White House fully cooperated with the special counsel's investigation. You're aware of that? Mm -hmm. Today, yes or no, Mr. Barr, under the penalty of perjury, do you testify that that statement was true at the time you made it? I, th I thought it to be true at the time I made it. On Why isn't it true? June 9th, I'll get to that, Mr. Barr. I mean, it, does, it, does it have Mr. to Barr, do with quibbling I will get to over? that. Reclaiming my time, you answered the question. Okay. I have another question for you. On June 19th, 
of no, 20 Actually, I need to answer that uh, question. Mr. Attorney General, you did answer the question. No, you I'll said under penalty of perjury. I'm going to answer the damn question. Okay? You said the answer and, was and, yes, and, is what you said. Well, Are you saying no? I think what I was referring to, and I'd have to see the context of it, was the supplying of documents. No, Mr. Attorney General, this statement was not limited to the supply of I, documents. You stated at a press conference. Mr. Attorney General, I, I reclaiming my time. Reclaiming about. my time. I think that's what I was talking about. I think that's what I was talking about. On April 19th of 2019, that the White House fully cooperated with the special counsel's investigation. You knew when you made that statement that the president had not agreed to be interviewed by the special counsel. Now, on June 18th uh, of I this year, Mr. Attorney General, I was referring to on the June 18th, production of documents. Mr. Attorney General, on June 18th of this year, the Department of Justice issued a statement saying that Mr. Berman, a former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, had, quote, stepped down. You're aware of that statement being released by the department, correct? Yes. Yeah. And do you testify today that that statement was true at the time the department issued it? Uh, he, he may not have known it, uh, but he was stepping down. He may not have known that he was <laughs> stepping down. That's your testimony today? He was that being he, removed. Mr. Attorney General, the statement did not say that he was being removed. It did not say that he was being fired. It said uh, that he was stepping down. And was, apparently your testimony today is that I, that was in fact accurate when Mr. Berman has testified under oath to this committee that it in fact was not. Now I want to talk about No, no, he was process. removed. Mr. He was General, removed. And I, I wanted an opportunity to offer him another job. I understand and your rationalization the next, the next for your day. answer, but the American it's people not a rationalization. will let your answer speak for itself. Now, Mr. Attorney General, earlier this year, President Trump stated that he had planned to make what he described as Vice President's, quote, uh, Ukraine dealings an issue on the campaign trail. Earlier this year, on February 10th, you stated that you had set up a, quote, intake process for submission of information, uh, excuse me, intake process, end quote, for submission of information relating to the Ukraine, to the Justice Department, and that included, quote, these are your words, anything Mr. Giuliani might provide. Do you recall making those comments? Something along those lines. You concede there isn't anything standard about the Attorney General creating a special process for information related to advancing. I disagree. And, you disagree. And, and, and I also made it clear that that is a vetting process that's available to anybody. Is that right? Which U.S. Attorney have you assigned to receive information from Vice President Biden's personal lawyers regarding President Trump? Well, Maybe if they had vetted the dossier, there, there's uh, no, maybe if they vetted the there, dossier, there we, no wouldn't, we wouldn't have the whole Mr. Russia Attorney Gate General, problem. there's no U.S. Attorney, of course, that you've appointed to do that because what, what, what you, you have about? done with respect to this process is unprecedented. Now, it was cautionary you, so that we do not Mr. pollute General, the criminal investigative process with I, Ukrainian disinformation. I will give you an opportunity to explain this intake process. My what, understanding what, is that you have directed. The you Eastern, are going to give me an opportunity? You, I, I plan, I intend to right okay. now. The Eastern District of New York, the U.S. Attorney responsible for that district, my understanding is that you have asked that U.S. Attorney to be responsible for the intake process. Is that right? No. That's wrong? The U.S. Attorney? The U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District was given oversight of all <laughs> Ukrainian-related cases, any new cases involving Ukraine. Correct. We face a problem with Ukraine, which is unreliable information coming in it. I appreciate There's a lot of corruption that. there. It's a hall of mirrors. Mr. Attorney General, And I, I wanted to make sure that. that before we got into criminal pro proceedings, and this was to everyone's benefit, particularly Vice President Mr. Biden, Attorney General, that the information was scrubbed I appreciate in conjunction you with that, the intelligence and that is consistent community. with the memo that you issued, which said, any and all new matters related relating to Ukraine shall be directed exclusively to the Eastern District of New York for investigation and appropriate handling, just as you've described right now. Now, of course, the U.S. attorney responsible in the Eastern District of New York was recently changed. My understanding is a few weeks ago, you announced that Seth Ducharme would be taking over to replace Rich Donahue. Mr. Ducharme, prior Pittsburgh is in charge role, of the vetting. I, Mr. Attorney General, prior to taking this position, Mr. Ducharme worked at Maine Department of Justice, is that correct? Yes, he was a counselor to Maine. And, he then, was he, and then he was the, the principal uh, 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 assistant deputy at attorney general. That's right, and rather than having the acting U.S. attorney, uh, the deputy U.S. attorney, rather, in that district they served, wanted to swap jobs. you now have appointed your prior counsel to oversee that very same process. With that, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. The, gen the gentleman yields back, uh, Ms. McBath. Mr. Chairman, before we go to Ms. McBeth, could I enter a couple of documents under unanimous, under, ask for unanimous consent to enter four documents. Uh, the two memos I referred to, setting the guidelines for who gets released, a, 
a Washington Post article about Paul uh, Manafort's release and a testimony from the Council of Prison Locals 333 th for the record. Without objection, Ms. McBath is not recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by thanking you, um, Attorney General Barr, for joining us today and for the work that the committed public servants in your department are doing to keep our country safe. But, sir, just a few months ago in May, you said that you would be taking the President's position in urging the Supreme Court to overturn the Affordable Care Act. When asked if you will still take that position, even if it means, and I quote, stripping millions of Americans of their health care in the middle of a pandemic, you stated that the case would not be argued until October and that the president expects to fix and replace Obamacare with a better system. Attorney Joe Bartlett, let's be very, very clear. A public as public health officials and data have shown us, this pandemic is simply not going away. Just last week, it was reported that one hospital was planning to send coronavirus patients home to die due to limited resources to treat them. So we're still facing an extremely critical and extremely serious situation. And even if you expect the president to figure out a new plan by October, the president has not yet put in place another system, nor is there any guarantee that he will do so by October, as you, quote, expect. So when you say you expect the president to figure out a new plan, you are taking a risk with millions of Americans' lives. You are risking the lives of millions, people who will not be covered for pre-existing conditions if the Supreme Court agrees with your position. Civil servants in your own department have disagreed with you on this matter. In fact, I'm introducing a statement by one of the lead attorneys on the ACA case, Joel McElvain, who resigned in protest when your department refused to defend the law as it is required. In my district, the 6th District of Georgia, Congressional District, there are over 300,000 people that have pre-existing conditions, and I, sir, am one of them, a two-time breast cancer survivor. Our state is continuing to battle hard against a resurgence in COVID-19 cases. So I'm asking you, sir, not to gamble with American lives not to gamble with my life. And I'd like you to confirm that if the president has no other plan in place by October, you will reverse course and drop your position that I quote you directly, the entire ACA must fall. Um, I have two children who are cancer survivors, so I feel very strongly uh, about this issue as a matter of policy, and I believe that the president's made clear uh, that he will ensure that Sir, there will- Sir, please answer my question. Will you stop playing politics with well, I, Americans' health care in the middle of a pandemic? I'm not playing politics. I'm the lawyer. I'm not in charge course. of health care policy. Will you reverse your course and make sure that millions of Americans like me that depend on health care and treatment to stay alive, will you reverse your course to make sure that we have the ability to be able to live in this country freely with quality health care. People will have the health care protection, and that will be accomplished either if I lose, okay, if, sir, the, government, I, wait, I if the government loses no. the case, I if the Supreme Court no. strikes it down, then I, I think- I take this as a no. Ba sir, no, I want based to on history, on. there will be- Sir, I'd like to go on. I'd like to briefly mention my concerns rela relating to gun violence, because that's actually Re how I I'm got sorry, relating to Washington. What? what? I want to briefly go on to another concern that I have relating to gun violence. That okay. is actually how I got here. Okay. During the coronavirus outbreak, the nation has seen a dramatic increase in firearm sales and skyrocketing numbers of sales blocked by failed background checks. In March alone, the NICS background check system blocked 23,000 attempted sales. In other words, in one month, there were 23,000 attempts to get a firearm by a person who was not allowed 
to possess one under our current law. And it is a federal crime for anyone to lie in an attempt to get a firearm, which is what I suspect most people try to do. I'd like to know from you how many of these March block sales were investigated? I, I sent out a, a directive that we should start prosecuting to the extent we can uh, these lie and try uh, cases. Previously, we hadn't really been pursuing them. Okay, so I take that as a no. I just have one no, more question. No, I, well, so I'm saying we are up. pursuing those cases. My time is up. I take that as a no. Unfortunately, this fits a larger pattern of your administration neglecting the health and safety of Americans. From health care to gun violence, this administration is failing to keep my constituents and people all over the country healthy and safe. I demand better. Americans demand better. I want you to provide the answers that you are either unwilling to provide us or don't have answers to to this committee because these are relevant questions and we need to have answers from you. And I yield back the balance Mr. of Chairman, my time. The Mr. Chairman, the Mr. John, I got a question. What purpose, for what purpose does the gentleman seek? For months you've tried to get the Attorney General to come. He's here. Why don't you let him speak? Why don't Thank you let him answer the questions? The gentleman is not ready. Time after time. If you gentlemen, want the Attorney General to come, at least let him answer the questions the and the accusations made against the him. The gentleman's rudeness is not recognized. Rudeness? <laughs> rudeness, rudeness is on the other side. Mr. Stanton is this time after hearing. time, you refuse to let Stanton the Attorney General of the United States answer the questions Mr. posed Stanton, to him. Mr. Stanton is recognized. Well, maybe the last few witnesses will actually let the Attorney General Mr. speak. Attorney General. The, the Mr. Stanton is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Attorney General, thank you very much for being here. Since the passing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, those who have sought to suppress the minority vote concealed their intentions. The suppressors suggest that they were really out to advance some altruistic goals, such as election security. But history has proven that those allegations and those rationalizations were lies designed only to fend off legal challenges. It was a dirty little secret. And those who aimed to suppress the minority vote never dared to say it out loud. But not Donald Trump. He didn't even try to keep it a secret. He just blurted it out. He said he will lose the 2020 election if more Americans are able to vote. That's one reason why this president needed a fixer at the Department of Justice from letting Russia off the hook to rewarding Roger Stone. Mr. Barr, you've proven not only very willing, but I have to admit, very able. More than a year ago, this committee heard testimony about a resurgence of discriminatory voting practices, certain states making it more difficult to vote. These practices include unnecessarily strict photo ID requirements and the abuse of signature match requirements to reject absentee ballots. Despite that, your department has a lax approach to enforcing Voting Rights Act. During your tenure, you filed just one case to do so. But the DOJ has done nothing to block the suppression practices we heard about over a year ago before this committee. And to your credit, Mr. Barr, you warned us. You told the New York Times Magazine earlier this spring that the DOJ's role in protecting the right to vote would be limited this year, and that it would be up to the states to police themselves. Isn't that right, yes or no? I don't recall saying that, but if you say it's in the article. It's in the New York Times article from just last month. In that same news story, you said it would be up to the voters to referee the election. Is that right, yes I, or no? I don't remember the context of that, frankly. I th was I talking about foreign influence? <laughs> No, sir. I'll submit it for the uh, record. You'll have a chance to review it and uh, submit additional testimony if you desire to. Someday, when we have more time, you'll have to explain to me how a person whose right to vote is denied by a discriminatory practice can referee an election. That doesn't sound But I digress. Like it troubles me that you have not been consistent in your approach. As the Attorney General, you have stood down on discrimination and allowed states to make it harder to vote but you have used the DOJ as a sword when attempts have been made to make it easier to vote. Voting right advocates in South Carolina and Alabama sought to prevent Americans from choosing between voting and risking their health by making it easier and safer to complete an absentee ballot during the pandemic. But your DOJ intervened to try to block that accommodation. Mr. Barr, did you discuss either of those cases with the president? Yes or no? No. 
The American people. I, I don't even know. What two cases are you talking about? I, Cases in which... Uh, Tell me the name of the cases. I don't have the name of the cases. cases where South where were Carolina they? and uh, Alabama. You'll have a chance to comment after your testimony is done here today. The American people <clears throat> have good reason to believe that you will continue to use your authority to carry out the president's wishes to suppress the vote. And there are fears that you and the president are laying the foundation to interfere with the upcoming election, specifically with vote by mail, as my colleagues have previously noted, because both of you have advanced false conspiracy theories about mail-in voting. And I hope we can put some of those fears to rest here today. Mr. Barr, can you commit to the American people that you will not interfere with the decisions of state and local authorities to use vote by mail and absentee ballots in the 2020 elections? That's a yes or no question. Well, I think the federal government has very limited ability to get involved in this, but I'm not going to give up whatever ability we have to ensure the integrity of the election. I've never, you know, m my observation was simply that it would inject some uncertainty into the election process and it would opens up the Mr. Barr, potential of fraud. And I think the integrity yes of our no elections Mr. is Barr, very important. The president has suggested that only votes counted on election day should be what matters, meaning that if a voter casts a legal ballot on or before election day, but that ballot is not counted on election day, it shouldn't count at all. So I want to ask you again about your commitment to ensuring that every vote is counted. If in this upcoming November election, the president asks you to intervene and try to stop states from counting legal ballots after election day, will you do the right thing and refuse, yes or no? I will follow the law. You won't say no, sir? I'll follow the law. It's very disappointing. If, well, well, if a state, if a state has a law that says, if a state has a law that says it has to be cast on election day, that's the law. Will that you will commit to making sure the Department of Justice does not get involved in a contested I, election, yes or no? I will follow the law. It is so disappointing that we can't get a clear answer on that. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record the following items. An item from The Guardian uh, magazine, an embarrassment, Trump's Justice Department goes quiet on voting rights. Second, New York Times magazine, William Barr's state of emergency. Finally, from The Washington Post, Trump's assault on the election integrity forces question, what would happen if he refused to accept the loss? That objection, the material will be uh, based Mr. Chairman, just for the record. That objection. A member of the Judiciary Committee, following the law, without objection, following the law should, should be something a member of the Judiciary Committee knows the gentleman is pretty suspend. darn clear. The gentleman will suspend without objection. The material will be uh, entered into the record. Ms. Dean is recognized. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, could, I, could we take a five-minute break? Ms. Dean is recognized. Could we take a five-minute break, Mr. Chairman? No. That's a common courtesy, Ms. Dean Mr. Is Chairman, of every witness. I, I waited 45, uh, are, an hour for you this morning. I haven't had lunch. I'd like to take Mr. a five-minute break. Mr. Mr. Attorney General, we're, we are almost finished. We're, we're, we're going to be finished in a, in a few minutes. If, if, otherwise, uh, you can, we can certainly take a break, but... Um, you're real you're class. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> real yes, class after the, yes, after this, if you still well, want one, we'll have a break. No, he wants a break now. You want it now? And you just, you just committee, mentioned committee, rudeness. Committee I think we're seeing it on display. Let's let the Attorney General have recess. a break. Committee will stand in recess now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.